There can be only one. I have come here to chew bubblegum and kick ass. All out of bubblegum. Go ahead. Make my day. Cinema Royale. I'm too old for this shit. I can't believe that just fucking happened. Groovy. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the special, special edition of Cinema Royale, because it's the big damn 20th episode. We reached number 20. Keep your excitement to yourself. Jeez, wow. Tough crowd, tough crowd. <laughs> wow. <Thank> you. <laughs> wow, a little late there. <laughs> supposed to be on cue. Yeah. Supposed to be on cue, guys. Oh okay. My God. Supposed to be on cue here. Okay. Anyways, I'm we Mike. Did it. And uh, let's just choose. Yay! Fuck. <laughs> Screwing me up. Eh, tough, 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 tough to do this. Anyways, Timing. I'm. Mi- <laughs> God damn it! Distractions. Distractions all over the place. <laughs> I'm Mike, and let me introduce you to my fellow film officiados. Fail. Yes, this is our host, Goddamn Distractions. <laughs> First up, James Sullivan, also known as High Me Tude. <laughs> Tonight's broadcast is brought to you all by a shameless self plug here. Uh, from pages to pictures, uh, Die Hard versus Nothing Lasts Forever is up on that fellow in the coat dot com right now. Check it out. Uh, <laughs> this episode is also brought to shameless you- self plug done. Good for you. I am proud of you, James. You need to do that once in a while. I- you can whore yourself out anytime you want. I think I've done yeah. that a few times here, so there's yeah. no shame. Yeah, Matt did it, so James's turn. Yep, yeah, go ahead. Fine. Yep. Anyways, this episode's also brought to you by the album from 1981, a smooth jazz album known as Garfield, Am I Cool or What? An album all about Garfield, sang by the famous artists known as The Temptations, Patti LaBelle, Natalie Cole, The Point of Scissors, and of course, Lou Ross. And lots more. What do I think about it? Yay! It's pretty cool. Some are good. Mm. Some are bad. I actually have a physical copy of it. I found it at Walmart for five bucks. So, (laughs) collecting dust for... So, for a $5 Walmart CD, it's not that bad. It's not that bad for five bucks. It's it's not bad. If you can find it at your local Walmart, go ahead. Go find it. Or you can go on YouTube and check it out. I feel like that was a shameless plug, but it wasn't even my thing. Ah! I kill me. <laughs> uh, also coming up here is Matt Brunet, also known as Animat. And this podcast is also brought to you by Silva, because his legs will show you things that you don't know that legs can do. Did you Who guys not Silva? see that? Um... UFC wrestler, apparently yesterday he was in a big fight and his leg uh, apparently went 90 degrees the wrong way. Oh, I heard go, about go that. Go check it out on Google. You'll see. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. I know what you're talking about. I heard Trust about me, it. Trust me. Like, his Ugh. leg just did a thing oh. that legs aren't supposed to be doing. Yeah. Yeah. Uh. And last, but not least... You know what's funny is that when I I first heard about that news, I was looking at the wrong guy. (laughs) Oh, this guy's okay. Wait, wait. That's the wrong guy. Okay. Oh, okay. (laughs) No, it was just like yesterday. I was like, what's wrong with his legs? I I don't get it. And then, like, just today, I was like, oh, legs can do that? (laughs) (laughs) Oh, and last but not least, the forthcoming storm known as Morgan Ledger. (laughs) 
after tons of internet outages, after fighting Can I get many, an a- many amen? college essays, final exams, I am... Pardon? Sorry, what? Can I get an amen? Amen. Amen? Long story short, I can finally say, glad to be back. (laughs) It is glad to finally hear your voice. We missed you, buddy. Yeah, there's just been so much going on in my time, (laughs) to say the least. It's understandable. And just in time for... Go on. I said, you know, there's even one point where I actually even lost my voice uh, somewhere down the road, so it's a good thing we're not doing this. Um, in that era where I'm just sitting there drinking mm. tea, jello, or whatever to calm my throat down. Oh, thank God. Jello pudding pop. Now, don't you stop me with my impressions. You know exactly where what happens when I get too deep in these kind of sitting the urges. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, just still got it. Still got it. Uh, all in time for the great topic of this 20th episode, it's box office bombs. Movies that have failed at the box office. Dun, dun, dun. Oh, boy. What else does it say about it? There's movies that try to succeed at the box office, and audiences didn't go to see it, and they bomb at the box office. Mm-hmm. It's pretty bomb? much a rare occurrence that um, a movie, like, when a movie didn't really make its money back, but, like, when it happens, often it can lead to disastrous results. Or pretty much every, or just pretty much the press and everyone else just poking fun at it. Yes. Yes. Hmm. Well, so, uh, uh, uh... Uh, let me uh, let me start this start. off. Let me start this off here with a movie that I just saw on the list here on the Wikipedia list that is, and it's something uh, two of the co-hosts here have seen before. I'm talking mm-hmm. about. Oh no! It better not. The, uh, it better not be what I think it is. No. I'm talking about. No. <laughs> I'm gonna mention. Right, no. Yes. The Nutcracker in 3D. Ah, oh, you, oh. you. I just noticed I'll it right now, and I'm like, oh my god, Morgan again. and James just seen it. <laughs> what rotting nightmare has this come from? Uh, yes. So, do tell of this film. You know, for a second there, I thought you were going to bring up Mars Needs Mumps. That'll be next. Yeah, same here. Same here. I was like, (laughs) oh no, we're not starting with that, are we? (laughs) No, I figure it's just the season to talk about the Nutcracker in 3D since it's the holiday season. (laughs) Okay, well, let's Uh, talk about this just a little bit more, shall we? Uh, Like, uh, there are so many... uh, Okay. Well, since there are now, so many like Nutcracker adaptations, what makes this one like so like? How can I put this? How does this one make it look bad? You know, like well, what? Watch our video. It definitely says for itself. But for those who have not seen the video that you guys are talking about, do explain briefly of why it. Uh, All right, I think I think I'll spare James and go first. I mean, we're talking about a movie that had a ninety million dollar budget and it only grossed like what sixteen million. I mean, we're talking about a film that a director had in mind since the nineteen eighties, and he had all that time to create his vision, um, perfect it do something with it at least something creative something unique develop it into something 
you know, intriguing, amazing, eye-inspiring. Did we get that? No. Instead, it's just a confusing romp that's trying to fuse a narrative with these many different ideas and peaks, and it doesn't work for those reasons. I mean, uh, Christmas Carol has like what 200 adaptations if you include if you include the tv specials how many does nutcracker have is what i ask you how many does it have like 10 or 15 and that's pretty sad because you can do pretty much a lot with it and here they just really i don't know i i haven't seen much of the director's work i guess he's an independent artistic art house kind of character and i don't and i'm not saying that in an insulting way i mean that in sort of uh these are the kind of people i don't really see that much i know i should but eh, it is what it is but having that on deck and him trying to make a kid movie doesn't really work well especially when you have things that are just literally lost in translation not going to work really well not going to be well accepted um for example there's another adaptation that me and james saw which was crafted in japan in 1979 and um that one was actually the better version for those who don't know it's called nutcracker fantasy and there's a lot of stuff they do with the nutcracker mythos like the hard nut, which is how the Nutcracker came to be. Um, the stuff with Claire, which is what she's called in this one. Um, and just fusing together Japanese pop culture um, as materials. And even though there's some stuff that does get lost in translation, it's easy to understand in some cases because it's still the Nutcracker. If you know the story very well, you can actually connect to many of these certain things. Like, for example, there's a plot element called the Heart of Darkness that needs to be destroyed by some mythical samurai sword. Um, Nutcracker in 3D. Uh, it's tr Or Nutcracker, the untold story, which is what it should have been untold. It really, you know, it really tries to go by the basic paint-by-numbers kid tale but it's just it's just a, a mess it's like the director is saying okay i'm making a family movie here but i need to do things that other kids films do okay let's have some dark elements because that's what kids movies have dark elements let's have some light-hearted kitty moments because that's what other kid movies had light-hearted kitty moments the problem is they are not done in the right way. There's forced musical numbers by Tim Rice of The Lion King. I kid you not. There's weird things, which I guess are done for the kids, but even stuff like that would go over their heads, like Nathan Lane as Uncle Albert, and he looks like Albert Einstein, so he should really just be Uncle Albert Einstein. Even has E <laughs> equals MC squared on a little mini chalkboard during dancing sequence <laughs> uh, there's really poor acting and let's not and forget Albert Albert Einstein Einstein stealing a, a little boy's rock or admitting <laughs> to stealing a little boy's rock <laughs> oh yeah i forgot about that the fact that he actually like steals like the father's um mini pebble or something like that and he gives it to him years later or <laughs> some weird thing like that i guess <laughs> um it was his uh but i think the biggest part of crime special rock collection yeah yeah but let's let's go on to the main main event the what really makes this movie fail the most um we've seen something wicked this way comes right we, we've all seen that we've seen return yeah. to oz right okay yeah. we've seen john carpenter's the thing we've seen peter jackson's the frighteners those movies have dark stuff. And even the mature movies I just tossed out there, they have dark stuff too. But they work because of the tone of the film, um, what it's building to, and how it's relating to it. Frighteners has a bunch of ghosts running around. They have like a serial killer who's also a ghost, which clever. Um... Something Wicked This Way Comes has a twisted carnival being owned by a mad 
um, tattooed Jonathan Price, who's very chilling, very death-like, and that works to its advantage. This movie is supposed to be, well, it is set at Christmas. This movie is supposed to be a Christmas film. It is taking a Christmas classic and trying to do something with it. But the problem is, the majority of the material that we have to sit through that is so dark, so harsh, so mean-spirited that we are left with nothing but a bitter taste in our mouth. What am I talking about? I'm just going to say this in one sentence to completely describe it. The conflict involves a bunch of humanoid rejected who's from Ron Howard's live-action Grinch movie who have Nazi-like qualities who who are led by John Turturro, who looks like Andy Warhol with a complete huge fetish for dark, twisted artistic abilities, who have a huge plan to block out the sun by stealing kids' toys and actually burning them. So when the smoke fuses from the chimneys, it will block out the sun and they, they will live forever. How is this a Christmas movie? I ask you. Well... I think you you hit you you hit something really hard here. Uh, the the big problem is the fact alone that it is mean spirited. Uh, it is so mean spirited, and it is the Nutcracker story. I'll I'll admit that I'm not I'm not a, a huge fan of. I, I don't I don't really do ballet. I I uh, I, I sat that. through some other Nutcracker adaptations. I. And it's it strikes me as a story that's meant to be very innocent, very fairy tale like. This is none of that. This is not innocent. This is. I. I even I have the Nightmare Prince more creative than this. I have an experience with uh, well, I'll, I'm not going to fault them for. For against creativity, I I admit uh, John Turturro as a humanoid rat on a motorcycle that's armed with guns is unfortunately very creative, but it's the wrong kind of fucking creative. Yeah, uh, it's it's just the problem being that I every time I edit together one of my web shows, it always gives me a different sensation. It gives me a more intimate feeling with the film that I'm I'm looking at, and so when I'm it's, cutting together uh, this, uh, uh, when I'm cutting together this uh, this uh, episode of me and Morgan rip it, ripping this movie to pieces, uh, I admit during during the during the initial run. The, First watch, the uh, there was something t- to it that I said. Uh, this is so, this is so bad. I'm enjoying riffing it. Well, not while I'm editing the riff. You cut it down to thirty minutes, which is not even close to enough. It should be cut to zero. And so. That's I think that, it should be that's cut. how mean spirited it is. That's how <laughs> that's how mean spirited it is. That is how 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 wrong it is on on every level. This movie is pretty much like um, Jake Norvell's reaction to "That's My Boy." It's so tasteless. We don't even have a PKA meter to rate exactly how harsh, horrifying, terrible, and absolutely soulless it completely is. I've seen Wes Anderson movies that are far more humorous and quirky compared to something like this. Oh no, wait! Wes Anderson is definitely far more credible than this hack. I've seen. <clears throat> I've seen R-rated horror films that are less frightening than this. I mean, say what you will about having, you know, a a, a kids movie with scare moments in it. It, <sighs> Yep, 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 yep. That's the same mind. Like it definitely got at the wrong audience. Mm-hmm. 
Well, I yeah, think before I we mean, move any if you're further, or do anything, I think we should like, start spiritedness. off by with the basic. I mean, it's one thing we should probably think here, and again, hate to go off topic, but I kind of have to, to um, get a point across here. But considering we're dealing with box office bombs, I think what should be noted is that there's three kinds of bombs that we are dealing with here. There's the films that deserve to bomb, like this one. There's the films that don't do well at the box office, but you kind of wish they did. Like, this had something going for it. This had something unique. Why didn't it do so well? And I think the summer of 2013 is a huge example of that. We had, like, really good epics, really good movies, and a whole load of them either um, sucked big time or they just literally went under the radar. And then you have the feature films, which I'm trying to think of that third aspect of the the bomb, but the fact that you have classic films we see today like Citizen Kane, The Wizard of Oz, I'm not even kidding, that had a very, very bad reputation. And then later over time, people kept watching it again and again, and they're like, actually, this isn't too bad of a movie. You know, why did people hate this in the first place? So, Mm -hmm. you know, we have films that sort of fall into that realm where it's like, this isn't as bad as we thought it was back Mm -hmm. then, and it still kind of holds up to this day. So people have a more forgiving range when a movie doesn't do well because they have the aspect of home video and television to at least revisit it again and again and again. But you have movies that are just so god-awful that the generation it was presented to they won't pick it up that well and they'll just keep on passing it down saying avoid at all costs put it in the recycling bin while you have the chance and i think nutcracker 3d falls into the fourth category and that is the 1930s bonfire (laughs) Uh. we should reefer madness this movie (laughs) It is that terrible. <laughs> <laughs> this could fall into the lab. Warn your children about the in yours. 3D. Warn your child in yours and yours and maybe yours. And and I just discovered something about the director of this film. He directed mm-hmm. Tango and Cash. The what? If you're not sure what Tango See, and Tango and Cash is a film featuring Sylvester Stallone and Kurt Russell back in 1989. Mm -hmm. And he directed that movie, the same director as The Nutcracker in 3D. Oh, dear God. So if you've seen Tango and Cash, that's the director. Hmm. No, see... (laughs) Anyways, um, Matt, why don't you mention a film? Well, um, I don't really want to mention a film right now, but I want to me- me- mention something that really proves an interesting and a very interesting point. I don't know if I have mentioned this earlier, like in a previous episode, but I remember in a previous article that I, in an article that I've read, in it talks about um, Steven Spielberg and George Lucas recently that they were talking about apparently that the Hollywood system is going to implode on itself. Pretty much that mm. they're they're releasing more and more expensive films, and like they're and like sometimes they would lose more and more money, and sometimes like it's really hard for them to get like their money back on some of the things, and. You know, just watching like the list that you gave me, well, you gave us. This mm-hmm. is it's scarily true because like the top box office bombs that we see, they're all either like there are only a few that came from the '90s, and the rest are in the 2000s. Mm-hmm. And it's kind of scary to think that like so many of these films are pretty much like it's true that. People are spent like they're spending more. Hollywood is spending more and more money to produce films, 
pretty much it's like it's not going to be surprising if we're ever going to if we're ever going to hear of the first ever uh, movie that'll have a billion dollar budget. So one of the main reasons why movies pretty much like one of the biggest reasons that they bomb is pretty much that they're pretty much overspent in the first place. They're trying to hype up so much on this idea that didn't really like that might not even work out as much because the more money you spend, the more money, the more chances that it becomes like a huge gamble. And that's and that's one of the things. Now, as for a movie mm-hmm. that I would like to mention, because my I might as eh, screw it, might as well do it now. Just, let's just get rid of it. Morgan, are you ready to talk about Mars Needs Moms? I know you just finished oh, your little rant Mark's about a, 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 the Red Cracker really Treaty, but here. Uh, no. I, I think you still got some steam in you. <laughs> yeah, I think we, but like, pretty much not only is Mars Needs Moms, like, on the list that you gave us, it's not, it's actually the biggest box office bomb, like, ever, which um, Disney actually lost $130 million, which also led the shutdown of um, of uh, the of the company by uh, hold on a sec I, I just got a memory loss by Robert Z- yes Robert Zemeckis company Image Movers Digital's Image downfall. Movers Digital yeah it pretty much led to their big downfall and like it, it, it's kind of understandable because one of the biggest reasons is that the care is mostly because of uh, the animation. I think I truly believe that the animation led to their biggest downfall, mostly because of how the characters look. It's like they're trying to make them look realistic to the point that uh, it's it, it, nobody understands why are they even doing it in in a motion capture animation when they could just do it in real life. Like, okay, but yeah, there's the aliens, but you don't have to do it on the human characters. Like, you can make them real. But, like, many of the characters, like Milo and their mo- and his mom, don't even look human. Like, they, they just look disgusting, and they kind of look scary. And, like, that's another... And another reason is that the script is actually very unoriginal, and often it can get mean-spirited. Often, like, you see Milo can often be, like, a huge dick... And that's a big pro, and like, you and like that. That's one of the biggest things. It's like, you don't care about Milo, and yet, it's all about him. So that's a major points off. And also the thing is, is that it really does get repetitive. You know, so many there are so many times. It's like, the kid, like they they always just like run away, then fall down into the garbage where all the male aliens are. And then, like, he realizes, I gotta find my mom. And, like, they, they, they keep on repeating that. So it's repetitive, unoriginal, mean-spirited, and pretty much ugly to watch. So it's not surprising how it did kind of fail. And the worst thing is, is that this is a, a really well-known problem that Image Movers Digital have. Some of their previous films, like, um, uh, some of their previous films, including... Polar Express. Um, Polar Express, A Christmas Carol, Beowulf, and stuff like that. They all have these really human, like, they all have this motion capture where often they don't really need it. Like, they, 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 they don't need this, like, they don't need the motion capture. They're making, like, they're literally animating people in a way that it doesn't make sense. Like, Tintin. That makes sense because they're turning the people into the Tintin characters. So it looks like a mixture that these people actually do look like they just came out of the comics. This one, it doesn't make sense, though. They're just making... They're just spending money to make people look like people. And that's, like... Mm. How does that make sense? Like, really? It doesn't. Oh. For me, the issue with uh, with Mars Needs Moms was was not that it was 
Oh, it was not that it was un unoriginal. I could I could pick uh, I could pick a a bunch of action movies or adventure films out of the hat and say, you know what? It, maybe it wasn't entirely original, but I I I had some fun with it. Uh, this uh, this film, it's uh, it's not enjoyable enough. It it lacks something. It 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 lacks Art. an overall quality of enjoyability to uh, to rebound from itself. Um, in the uh, in the in the uh, latter portion of the film, there, there is a uh, one character who comes out and says that he witnessed his uh, mother get killed by the, the Martians and this is a to the film's credit a devastating moment uh, but Maybe the problem is in order ones. for it, it seems like a, a cheap shot in order to get you you can it, it seems like a cheap shot uh, to try and get some sympathy from the viewer and the problem with that is in order for in order for uh, stuff like that to work the rest of the film has to be has to be uh, enjoyable. It wasn't. It was just uh, it was just fluff. Mm-hmm. No, but also I, I remember that scene that you were talking about. It's not really that. I don't find it to be a cheap shot. I find that it just came out of nowhere, and it's like it really it's really really harsh. That's my biggest issue is that it's like my, like suddenly you get these stupid moments like you get the silly aliens going around and then suddenly one of the guys just come out talking about this this really depressing story how he witnessed his mom died and he have to and like he left his home like he has to leave earth in order to witness that I was like my god what the hell was that about like, I just thought it was being, it's like, it's like, yeah, you might find it, call it a cheap shot. I find it a little, like, this is, like, a little too dark for its own, like, for itself. Mm -hmm. At least that's what I find. Okay. Uh, you know, James, I'm going to say this right now. You better start jumping on the next train to San Jose because apparently there's something the advertising didn't address and it's the fact that this movie was actually based on a book by a Berkeley Brethed best known for Bloom Country oh dear I remember hearing about that mm -hmm. I I'm going to be guilty I did read the book um, I'm surprised to see a lot of the stuff they transitioned over there in fact um it's no surprise to say that milo's infamous line about asking why would he need a mother is actually straight from the actual not actual book and it's a picture book by the way if that helps and in this one the martians are actually all male and the big joke is that they don't know anything about parenting and they just kidnap this one mother just to do things that a mother would do and then the kid of course just like in the movie gets on the spaceship accidentally and uh, and just like in the film he arrives he sees what happens and he... you know what's fun funny is that 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 story right there like what what do you talk about the martians that sounds a little bit like Peter Pan, like, like Peter, isn't it like Peter Pan came in, like takes Wendy and the kids to go like to meet the Lost Boys, so Wendy can be like a mother to them. Yeah, I, I just like it just popped out of my head. It's, do that it's, whole... familiar. it's just uh, if. They do that whole thing where, you know, the mother saves them. He's like, we got to get them back to Earth. And the aliens are like, oh, my goodness, we can't do this whole thing. We got to send them back to Earth. And uh, I just, 
mm-hmm. you know, I can kind of forgive the book for a certain extent because it's an illustration, and I can't get mad at an illustration because it's a story, and stories on paper are passed down either way. They can either be left on the shelf or ignored. In the world of feature films, movies circulate constantly. I nearly ate my own hand when I saw four copies of this film sitting on the shelf in my retail store that I work at. And nonetheless, they were there Black Friday for eight dollars. And to make matters wow, worse, they were to sell out. They were combo packs. Seeing that next to James and the Giant Peach says a lot. Ooh. Oh. Dang. That's and bad. I like James and the Giant and I like James and the Giant Peach. And that's a good example of a movie that knows how to take its material and make it feasible and make it work to some extent. Mars needs mums. It's just nothing. It's just you know, there's a reason why I don't do angry reviews anymore. And if you watch um, that episode on vaulting, you'll you'll see why. Because I'm not just reading off of a script. I'm literally getting my anger on this movie. And I remember after filming it, I was really shaking badly. I was I was really bad after after filming that episode. And it's just this this film really damaged me completely in a very mental and physical way because I just had so much hate towards it. The first time around I saw it, I'm like, wow, this is a terrible movie. Second time around when I was rewatching it, it just didn't get any better. Third time around when I did an April Fool's gag where I tricked people into thinking I was going to show them Citizen Kane on my live stream. It turned out to be this one. The taste got so bad. It was the size of Pluto. I had to get it out there. And you can so you can, you can like, definitely see exactly. So that's like an EA for Fools is on you. Pretty much the entire the the entire episode I ended up doing in regards to this film felt like a complete anger management session. That's how terrible this film has caused me to do, and you know I can't do you know angry angry reviews because you have people like doug walker who can get away with that aspect they can be just like lewis black and be funny me i'm saying my opinion i'm saying my thoughts there's a distinction there's a certain um thin line between being funny and being serious and whenever i get angry it comes off being serious Mm mm-hmm so when you really do see that episode, for anyone who's listening to this, you you really see genuine hate towards this film. I am not exaggerating, over exaggerating. Genuine tears, genuine loathing, genuine f bombs. It's all there. Genuine motherly <sighs> therapy. Mm-hmm. I'm actually very thankful my mother was able to guest star at the end of that one, or otherwise it would have been a very, very empty and soulless conclusion. So yeah, I'm that, very that thankful was a re- for that. Yeah, yeah, that was that. That's honestly that's one of my favorite parts. Like in like what you have done in your shows, like that. That it really is heartwarming. It really got the feelings mm-hmm. on me. <laughs> And and in the twist of things, when you have something so harsh and dark, it's always good to have at least some light at the end, at least something significant to balance out all the harshness. But a film like that, good, good God, even Ron Dahl wouldn't write shit like that. <laughs> <laughs> <sighs> All right. Well, I think we've dwelt enough with this one. Yes, I think we have. Please let's let's move on for this turns into a therapy yeah. session. <laughs> okay. Yes. Um. So for the uh, for the listening audience, uh, I'd like to 
to note that we actually have two lists here, and uh, I would like to discuss a little something uh, that I found rather interesting about how uh, about how bad movies or how I shouldn't say bad movies, but bombs in particular are being tracked. Um, in this, uh, we have a Wikipedia list and another list from uh, the forester.wordpress.com I guess this is a blog site um, the Wikipedia list has uh, the has some of the biggest box office bombs and to calculate a bomb uh, they have an equation here it uh, in which how to uh, sh supposedly shows how to uh, calculate a bomb, and I was buzzing through the list. Um, it says, uh, according to the equation, if you uh, take the total world gross of the of the film, divide that by two, and subtract the budget, then that's how they calculate a bomb. The problem here is if you it if if you uh, divide it by two, that pushes the bomb factor even further into the negative. Uh, it makes it makes the bomb uh, out to be more than it actually is. Typically, when they when they calculate a bomb, they uh, uh, they just take the they just take the uh, how much it uh, how much it grossed and subtract how much uh, how much the budget was uh, uh, usually that's how much you have to go by to calculate the revenue from any film or the the income um, and furthermore, I also noticed that these uh, uh, this list on Wikipedia is calculating estimated losses. So uh, they have, to begin with, they have estimated budgets. And uh, I've looked some of these up as well. Uh, some, some websites have different budgets listed for different films. Uh, some websites don't have a budget listed at all, so it's really hard to track how much of a bomb something was by just the by just what information we're given and not actual industry data. Uh, the losses are all an estimate, so that cuts uh, that cuts into uh, the calculations as well, but it. The last thing I have with this list is that it pretends like it see it seems to be geared towards let's see every movie here uh, minus the uh, say Heaven's Gate and the Fall of the Roman Empire. Every movie listed here in the top fifty is uh, pretty much from the past hit. 20 years. I don't see anything here that's before 1990. And and so it feels like it's pretending. I'm I'm pretty sure that the bomb existed before 1990. Oh, well, obviously, yes. Yeah, that's yeah, the first movie I know that. There is another uh, list that says biggest box office bombs adjusted for inflation. Okay, mm -hmm. well, t okay, yeah. Like you said, there's only Heaven's Gate and Fall of the Roman Empire that just got a, a few. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I see that. Yeah, on the wiki page, the top 50. But there's it... one thing that I... Sorry, sorry to interrupt, but there's one thing that, mm -hmm. that I don't get about, like, this list. Is that when I see, like, I see this, and sometimes it would say, like, um, like, let's say... Uh, the Lone Ranger. Apparently, the budget is around two hundred and fifty million dollars, but um, it but it actually got two hundred and sixty million dollars. 
Yet the estimate loss that it says is a hundred million. So why is it that it didn't say that it get like it actually got ten? It get it gave Disney ten million dollars, but instead here it said Disney lost a hundred million. I think it's because they're counting by domestic total. Because they're going like by this. the equation. Yeah, they're going by the equation. Yeah, they're going by the equation that I said. Uh, yes. Exactly. It uh, it confuses the heck out of you when it when it comes to the estimated losses. Oh, wait a minute. I think I can understand about the divided by two thing. I think I know why, because, like, when you go see a movie, when you pay your ticket, I think it's just pretty much half of it goes to the cinema and half of it goes to the movie itself. It's not like all of it goes to the movie. So, like, the, the cinema needs to have mm -hmm. some profit. So maybe that's where the divided by two comes from. And not to mention there's also promotional... Not to mention is also the promotional budget for advertising and stuff, but eh, few actually even do get into that kind of category. Promotions? I think that that goes with the. Uh, that goes with I the budget. I think that goes or, with or, the uh, budget itself. I think. Yeah, because I because I heard they sometimes don't add it in. They keep it like a separate sort of thing, like French fries. It's sort of like okay, we'll just total this all in later when it you know, brings it back, its own budget, or something like that. Or maybe that's just me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you have... You have a lot of, lit, of, of films on here that, uh, you know, when you, when you hear that they were a bomb, it's kind of like, okay, uh, uh, certain... A certain. I'm gonna just gonna pick a, a few out here. Osmosis Jones, uh, uh, Monkey Osmosis Bone, Jones is Sound on of the Thunder. List? Yes, mm -hmm. uh, you kind of look at those and say, well, uh, if you've seen them, then yeah, uh, maybe they maybe they deserve this this type of mention. But as on the on the same time, uh, you've got other movies in here, and maybe this is personal preference, but Sphere. Um, uh, Ender's Game, Hugo, uh, Speed Racer, Guilty Pleasure. Um, these are these are films that I honestly thought were good. In fact, Hugo, Hugo might just be one of the one of my favorite um, Scorsese movies. So I'm really surprised that uh, to find out that that bombed. I'm really surprised to find it on this list. It's yeah, a shame plus too, the fact, because... considering it was one of the big Oscar, uh, like it got major Oscar buzz, and like even at that point, it didn't even gain some money from it. Well, as I was trying to explain earlier, um, not all movies that bomb at the box office are terrible. I mean, there are thousands and thousands of excuses as to why um, said film hasn't done very well. I mean, consider this: Hugo was at a point when it was being released at the Thanksgiving mark. This was an era where we had an abundance of family movies. We had the Muppets. We had um, mm -hmm. Tank. What was Tangle released around that point? I'm trying to remember. Um, no, 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 no. That was, for... that was the year previous. Um, but I remember oh, right. there was Muppets. There was Hubert Go, And there, I think there was something else. It's an, I don't think it's an animated film, but... I, I I know Twilight Breaking Dawn Part One was around that year, and that was like one of the biggest attention, um, uh, whatever's of that uh, time, and that can be sort of a problem to factor there. We have a really good movie that's sandwiched in with all these others, and it's that choice of okay, which is going to be the good. Um, flick to a company here which is going to be that one good movie that's going to make my afternoon actually worth it and the same can be said for the summer 2013 we had like an abundance of blockbusters and they didn't do well because people had no idea what was going to be good for their own taste even they had even if they had like 
critical reviews and stuff like that, but even the critical reviews were no help because you had movies like World War Z and The Lone Ranger being trashed on for being overly budgeted and stuff. But um, I've seen both movies what they are, and I can say that aside from the production budget, people really need to look at the film as a whole in its narrative and its structure and how does it work for their case. And for me personally, World War Z was better than The Lone Ranger, even though I thought The Lone Ranger was okay, but it felt like the lost parts of the Caribbean 5 because it actually had those cliches and feels of that sort of thing. But you always have that scenario that even if you do have people saying go see a film a because it's better because as this or another person saying no go see film b because as this and this and this and this chances are critics are going to be wrong because it all amounts to the viewer's taste and what they think is a good movie in their eyes and because we had so much of this stuff we were completely lost and blinded knowing which was the true summer movie and that of course led to the complete split debate of whether or not man of steel should have survived that tide Mm-hmm. You know, that's actually true. I remember my parents actually went out to watch um, The Lone Ranger and they told it and they told me and my sister that they really, really enjoyed it because it was a lot like Pirates in the Caribbean. And, you know, I thought mm. to myself, like, maybe it's not as bad. As, like, may, I, like it, I really do question, like, how do the critics didn't really enjoy it when it's a lot like Pirates of the Caribbean? Like, like, they're not the best films, I understand, but, like, if it's yeah. like Pirates of the Caribbean in a good way, then how is it bad, you know? Like, I don't see where where it can go wrong with that. It's, I mean, I, how, what's wrong with a Western Pirates of the Caribbean? Well, I mean, I know we're talking about, you know, how does a film bomb in general, but you have people that go see like science fiction films and sometimes they have again a very variant taste of what they want their science fiction film to be whether it's kind soft and safe like et or flight of the navigator where it might have a risk whether it be big or small but then you have people that be like i want a really gritty dark very smart kind of sci-fi film like john carpenter's the thing or uh, or um just going to throw it out there but something along the lines of jurassic park per se where it's fun but even if it does have flaws it's something that at least pertains to them and it's sort of that option of you have so many again as an example so many sodas out there like pepsi diet pepsi um coca-cola diet coca uh, Coca coca-cola that when they take that first sip they know it's going to be their drink. They know it's going to be something they're going to enjoy. And that's how I often see movies. It's something that they're going to keep watching again and again, or they're just going to go in and see it just as um, their own enjoyment, just see what everybody's talking about. And you're not the only one. Um, Actually, uh, my family went to see The Lone Ranger on the 4th of July. I had to work that day, but they enjoyed it. And I was a little skeptical at first until I actually saw it. And I started seeing a good majority of the problems. It's sort of caught between being a very serious, dark, gritty blockbuster along the lines of Dark Knight or Batman Begins. And at the same time, it's trying to be Pirates of the Caribbean, you know, up and atty blockbuster kind of fun, sort of pertaining to the original 1950 show. And that was sort of the main problem I had there. It was in between two different styles, and they just really didn't feel like they were meshing very well. I mean, there were some things I did like um, appreciate, like the villain, but even that got a little too much at certain times with like um, eating the Lone Ranger's brother's heart at the beginning. <laughs> I thought that was like, what the hell? This is a Disney movie? Whoa. <laughs> what? Wait, what? <laughs> <laughs> Threw us off there. Wow. And I, and I thought the scene in Dragon Slayer where we actually see the baby dragons eat the dismembered foot of a princess be too much. Wait, in it's Dragon like, Slayer? Wow. What? Dragon Slayer. It's a 80s well, Dragon movie Slayer. I, I heard Dragon Slayer. Yes. I was like, what? <laughs> yeah, it's one of the uh, it, it's one of the un uh, un 
unfinished uh, death scenes by Dirk the Daring, you know? Mm, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Daphne, I'm here to save you! Uh, oh, you're a dragon buffet. Um, well, there's always oh, a chick great. from Legend. Okay. All right, okay. I'll, I'll take I'll take the body here. All right, yeah, might as well use it. Mm. I mean, it might be useful for uh, some. Oh man! <laughs> but you know, there are films that do have their own cult following, even if they are terrible, or even if they are like okay. I mean, I'm just tossing this out there, but I think we can all somewhat semi agree that Waterworld had a much more harsher reputation at its time. Yeah. yeah I is mean, Waterworld like, on this list? Um, uh, surprisingly, no. And I think the reason why is because it's at number 50. And number two, it somewhat seemingly made its budget back, but it had to rely on a lot of overseas totals just to get it back. So it seemingly yeah, gained its budget it's back, that but it's a box at... office. I I don't think it's really that it's a major bomb, but more the fact that they it didn't get as much as like the like the the producers were hoping for. I think that's mostly the thing. Like maybe it's not really that major mm, and of there's a, a box good ex- office exa- bomb, but like. It's like it didn't like it was typing itself to be like. I mean, a really the, good like, example of that. Now you should bring it up. Hit of the summer, like the next Titanic, or well, well, maybe Titanic's released that year, but. But I actually, wait. What did you say? Well, no, no. well, well no, um, but I actually have yeah. a. I actually have a. But I actually have a group of examples that I can think of when it comes to, um, like, box office bombs. But later on, they all gain a cult following. Um, During the 80s, when E.T. was released, that was pretty much the biggest movie ever. So much so that almost all the other films released during that time was was pretty much a bomb because everybody went to see E.T. I think... Ron was released at the same time as E.T., but I know for sure that yep. both Don Bluth's The Secret of Nim and Jim Henson's uh, um, uh, The Dark Crystal was released during that time. No, 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 like, no, pretty no, much no, 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 Dark Crystal was for Christmas. Nope. Oh, it was Christmas? I thought it was... Um, yeah, you're right about oh, Tron. I thought it was... You were right about Tron okay. being in the summer, but the Dark Crystal actually was in Christmas. Most of the Muppet movies are in the off season, as opposed to the summer. See Muppets from Space to know why. <laughs> oh God, yeah. Mm-hmm. No, but um, mm-hmm. no. What? About... What? Dark Crystal release? No, wait. What? What? Why didn't it? What was the Dark Crystal like? It didn't gain as much money because of something. Was it because of ET or, or something? I don't know. It's because oh, I'm par- confused. But any- anyway, because viewers were not accustomed. It's still made a lot of money on a budget of fifteen million. Hmm. But no. Was- um, the reason why that didn't do extremely well is because audiences were completely turned off by how it differed from most of Jim Henson's work because they were used to, it's the Muppet Show, yay! They were used to seeing Henson in his lighthearted material. Here he was going for um, a much different dark fantasy kind of spin, and they weren't really accustomed to seeing something like that. They weren't used to seeing something different and dark, and considering how the creative concerns with Henson's family-friendly um, aspect, it really overshadowed its competition um, that year. In fact, even it was up against Tootsie, believe it or not, and that had Dustin Hoffman in drag. Um, but luckily, it was still profitable, to say the least. It, it was like the 16th highest-grossing film of 1982 in North America. Um, but then again, as I said before, people have certain tastes on what kind of film they want in general, and I think 
that is of one of many good examples as to why it doesn't do very well. But yet over time, you can have someone experiencing it on like home video and saying, wow, this is not as bad as everyone made it out to be. What's so bad about it? And then they'll go over to Return to Oz and see why that one didn't do so well either. But regardless, they're both good films. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, but Return to uh, Oz is... Hey, Dorothy, bit, type yeah, your shit. Well, your... Yeah, I love... Like, pretty much what you said. Yeah. Yeah, but anyways, back to what I was saying to my points. So, I mean, okay, so it's Tron and The Secret of Nim. So on. about these two films, like, pretty much E.T. was so popular that it overshadowed both these films. And um, what happened afterwards, it's like, it, it pretty much went to gone into obscurity. But later on, Tron pretty much gained a cult following, and nowadays it's becoming a one of Disney, a, a pretty big franchise with Disney. Like late twenty years later, it gained itself a sequel and even a TV series, and like you could find find a lot of like Tron memorabilia around Disney, like like floating around. And the Secret of Nim has slow is slowly but surely gaining a cult following, and many many people do agree that. It's possibly Don Bluth's best work, like even more than like an American Tale, Anastasia, or The Land Before Time. And that really is saying a lot. Mm-hmm. It's funny considering back, and it's funny considering back then the critics were like praising it even more than E.T. because they were saying like that it, it this would this was actually the next Snow White. It was that good, like. It was revolutionary and all that stuff. Mm. So, yeah, pretty much like right now, the secret of him is not really that popular. It's still in like one of those five dollars. It's like still one of those five dollar movies that you sleep that you see. But it's slowly but surely gaining a cult following following. And a lot of people are recognizing it as an imp- like a real like an important piece of animation especially for something that went for 75 cents in the christmas season at my store 75 cents really yeah it was a little dvd decoration ornament it was shaped as an ornament we got them from walmart but we have the normal dvd for only three dollars surprisingly enough Ouch. Mm. How? That's just sad. Very interesting. And not a single copy of Secret Nim 2 in sight. <laughs> uh, or the rumored Secret of Nim 3, uh, the story of the young Jonathan Brisby. <laughs> Wait, what? Is, is that a real thing? It was a rumor. Is that- that started years and years ago just as a joke. Hmm. Oh. Hmm. No, they wouldn't. They wouldn't. I mean, there is no point for a Secret of Nim 2. I don't see any point anymore for another Secret of Nim. Honestly, like, just stay with Secret of Nim 1. Okay. Moving but, forward. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. I just realized something, though. It just made me realize. What the re- the explanation to why, um, like only recent films like from the '90s and into 2000s, why they're seen as major box office bombs, and like not from the previous one, why you don't really see like the Secret of Nim or Tron on this list, because the truth of the matter is that they did get money. It did get money. But it's just that it it didn't gain as much, like, it didn't lose as much. Like, nowadays, there are so many different films, and, like, more and more films are getting hyped. And, like, so, yeah, that's the thing. There's more films, there's more films at the cinema, like, simultaneously, while, like, some of the more big-budgeted ones are getting, like, so much ridiculous hype. Plus that we have, like, things like the internet and all that stuff to help add into the hype. 
it's going to be obvious that people would go see, like, people would definitely go and check out, like, The Dark Knight while, like, like a, a Medea movie would just sit there all by its lonesome, just <laughs> airing for, like, one, like, two people at the cinema. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Jesus, I talk. Um... Yeah, that's part we of, have discovered. That's part of the we reason. Made a discovery. That's part of why it, you have officially, you have officially covered another hot button topic that I do not want to go into. Oh, yeah. whoops! And, let, and let's not. But <laughs> I would like no, to. Oh no! I want to re. I want to reinstate. I, I know it's not that I don't want to talk. It's not that I want to talk about those films. It's just like I. I just wanted to use an example. I yeah, swear that's to example. God. Yes, I know. I know. It's I know. Just but example. I could write an entire novel it's, about it's it. It's just an example, Morgan. Calm the fuck down. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> just calm down. All right. All right. Anyways, I'm gonna go sit in the corner. I have honestly, I've not <laughs> talked throughout this whole episode. I mean, you guys took over, and I was just going to mention that the reason why a movie fails is because, one, the negative word of mouth, you know, critics, people saying, oh, don't go see that fucking movie, go to see something else. That's why the bombs out of the box is because people are saying, don't go see it, and etc. Not my fault. Um, another reason why it fails is because of lack of promotion. Like, a film gets, like, no promotion at all, and it goes right under the radar, and they get bonked because they have not been promoted so much. And, uh... <laughs> I, I was just reading the paragraph under the box office bombs on Wikipedia about the lack of promotion, and one of the movies that did not have a lot of promotion was one of the biggest one one of the biggest box office bombs was the Oogie Loves in the Big Balloon Adventure. <laughs> oh my god! It did not. We have, are back with the Oogie Loves. They have not had a good promotion yet. You see a poster being shown at some theaters, and it's you know only making a million back out of out of the fifty million budget. So it's like yeah, nobody talked about it, but afterwards it's saying, "Oh, it's the biggest box office bomb! Oh my god, it's the worst fucking movie Always ever." Always look up the bright <laughs> side of life. I think we're really Find a happy place. Crazy. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, another movie that did not uh, promote itself that much was uh, pff, let's see, Looney Tunes back in action, and it got it box. Yeah. And that got failed at the box office. I mean... Yeah, that, that was a really good one, too. It was... Uh, uh, I actually enjoyed Looney Tunes back in, back in Action. Mm-hmm. I went to go see that in the theater. I, I enjoyed it. I mean, what are some of the rest of these? Um... Uh, um, I let's mean, see. I'm trying to see what Batman uh, Mask of the Phantasm. That's another uh, one that didn't here's do a, it as a promotion. Here's a another favorite of Morgan's here, Freaked. Mm, so many good lines. <laughs> yeah, like not all movies are bad that bombs the box office. So there's a lot of good films out there that bombed at the box office, and they, mm-hmm. and like everybody said, they create a cult following, and that's a whole nother topic to talk about because that's a whole different genre of topic, cult films. You know what? I want to see that now. Much. Hmm. Yeah, James. Don't even even mention that movie. That's my territory. Exercy Road. What? You read that? You saw that Jersey one? Jersey Road. Exercy Road. Exercy um, Road. Yeah, Exercy Road is a 2006 thriller film. It's an independent film. It its budget was 1.3 million, and the box office total 30 bucks. Jeez. Yeah. Now this what is what happened. The... Uh, no, absolutely no uh, advertisement budget. Um. Let's see. The release was very limited. Very limited because it was shown 
once a day at noon for seven days, which was February 25th to March 2nd of 2006, at the Highland Park Village Theater in Dallas, Texas, a movie theater rented by the producers for a thousand bucks. So, you got a very limited, only one theater showing this damn movie, and it's... <laughs> and weirdly enough, it can be found at Redbox. Yes, I was just going to say... When it got released on DVD, it's the the only place you can find this film to go and see is at Redbox. So if you want to see why this movie failed, you have to go to Redbox just to see this movie. Hmm. Actually, looking at the parents' guide as we speak, just to see how. Oh nope, nothing major. <laughs> um. Yeah. I was or, gonna say, I, what I was uh, gonna say is that. Uh, Thanks to this list, I was hoping uh, sometime in the future I could see Cutthroat Island because that uh, that actually looks like a decent movie that bombed. Yes, yes, Cutthroat Island. <laughs> I mean, there's even films that are just made for a simple sole purpose, and even if they don't fulfill that purpose, they're labeled as a bomb by not the people but the studio. A clear example would be 1976's King Kong, which was made by Paramount because at the time Jaws was a huge, huge moneymaker. And the minute Jaws came on the scene, everyone was like, oh, we got to make our own Jaws. We got to make our own, you know, big giant monster movie. And King Kong, the remake, went through so many production hells that I could devote an entire. Uh, novel to it but it's best to at least read the historian account which i believe the book is called king kong the um crap i'm trying to look at the title here i actually have my list of books here it is it's called uh king kong the history of a movie icon from fay ray to peter jackson it's worth checking out for a lot of details and the thing i find interesting is that he, even though they really hyped this one up, they really hyped it to be like the next big Jaws, the next big blockbuster for Christmas, that in the long run, it did gain back its budget, which was good. But it only made $90 million, and that's when the big controversy happened. The studio said they were disappointed because it did not make as much money as Jaws. And the minute they said that, people got the first half of that quote that the movie didn't do well. But they also overlooked the idea that the only reason why they made the movie is because Steven Spielberg made a 20-foot-5 fish that made a boatload of green. Mm -hmm. Very, very underrated. So films can be really mistaken as a bomb just by that angle alone. Mm -hmm. So... The way I see it personally, aside from equation, the way I see a movie does very well is on two accords. Um, one is that it does really well in its box office run. And two, the word of mouth that it passes on, not just through weeks, but even through the year, is really, really high. And that's how I always, and because of this, that's how I always, you know, tell a movie does very well. Not just because of how much it gets back domestically, but also just because of how well it's being told throughout the the, uh, the public session. I recall stories of, actually I do remember um, being part of a t-ball game and people going and seeing Star Wars Episode One and saying how good it is and spoiling all the good stuff like, oh yeah, there's a scene where Dolph Ma Darth Maul gets cut in half and he falls down the shaft. That was like a great scene. And then finally when I saw it months later when it was released on video, I just sat there and said, what? This was the good movie everybody was talking about? I, what? I, uh, I, 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 I don't get this. And this is nine-year-old me, keep in mind. Um, <laughs> so because of those two scenarios, when it comes to labeling a movie a true box office bomb, for me personally, if it fails on these two scenarios, that's how I can see in my heart that I can rate it a bomb. But again, people have different views of how a movie can be labeled a success or a failure. And even Disney himself said, screw the critics, let's hear what the public has to say. And that's how he always judges films. 
not because of Laren Marlin giving it three out of five stars, but just because of what the public thinks, everything falls in their hands onto what they're going to spend five or eight dollars on a ticket admission. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that that's pretty much true. Because I remember at one point, uh, the lo- like when the Lone Ranger was pretty much bombing at the box office and everyone was poking fun at it, um, Jeffrey Bruckenheimer and Johnny Depp actually went out in public and say that they actually blamed the critics for their box office failures. And they try to, ple- to please the mm. Europeans that it's going to make a success there because Americans don't like it. But you're not the Americans. Come on. Why don't you watch it? But that's not the case. Like, (laughs) critics don't really that have that much power when it comes to making a movie a hit or a miss. It's pretty much they're just there to make recommendations. Like, if critics real if critics have the power to make a movie like succeed or fail, trust me, me alone can make Sony Pictures Animation run out of business. But that's not happening. Films like Hotel Transylvania and Cloudy with a Chance with Meatballs. Are do they actually did very well at the they actually did pretty well at the box office, you know like. Am I happy about it? Well, as a critic, not really, but that's how how it went. There are people who do enjoy these films, and that that's pretty much and that's pretty much the thing. You have to go with what the public. You have to pretty much follow the public, and not pretty not the critics. Although sometimes that that can help in order to improve the quality of the film. But we're talking about box office and money, so that, that that's a different issue. Mm. I mean, there are films mm-hmm. that haven't done very, very well, and it's just a shame to see them go through this kind of pain like The Rocketeer, and that's a movie that got a lot of great positive momentum from critics, but at the box office, it didn't do, like, spectacular or great, but yet over time, people are slowly but not as much realizing wow, this is actually not that bad of a film. Why don't people think of it that much? And as I said, it all pertains to taste. Hell, even Disney tried to get the international audience to save the movie by switching the distribution company from Walt Disney Pictures to Touchstone Pictures and trying to reach the teenage audience. They even had like a different poster campaign and all that stuff. And even that didn't do extremely very, very well. So... It's all about how the movie's pushed and advertised. Mm-hmm. And pretty much Something like that. Like the previous mentioned uh, Secret of Nim, it's the same story. Critics loved it. Mm. They were calling it the next Snow White. It didn't do well at the box office, but slowly but surely, everybody's starting to discover it and realize how good of a movie it is, and they don't understand how it failed. But in this case, they kind of did because E.T. Yeah. <sighs> Anybody gonna follow that up with any more discussions? Not really. When do we have dinner? <laughs> I think that sums. <laughs> I think that sums everything we need to talk about for this topic. I mean, I think I have nothing to say. I think there's. I think. I think there's one aspect we're also forgetting here too. More than just how a film does well in theaters, mm. but think about it: home video. That's true. Oh, that's true. That's true. Mm, well, yes, yes. Hotel Transylvania may do well at the box office, but think at how many people visited at Redbox. Actually, no, that's actually more of a different story because the bo- is... we're talking oh, about the box well, office. I mean, is an example. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. No, because like I know other examples when it comes to that, like um, all dogs go to heaven pretty much didn't do well at the box office because of the little mermaid but it ended up being one of the biggest uh uh one of the biggest uh, successes in home video and so is the princess and the frog it didn't do so well because of alvin and the chipmunks but it managed to get uh a big success on home on uh dvd and blu-ray that it ended up becoming a disney classic but that's a different entire entire topic mostly because we're talking about the box office and the success that it has done in theaters and not in a, and not in home video because that's pretty much a, an after effect. That's a different thing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Anyways, this has been Cinema Royale. I'm Mike, and along with me were 
James, Matt, and Morgan. <laughs> Ooh, what's the next episode? <laughs> uh, before I even say the next episode, I would like to say happy holidays to you guys, and I hope you have a happy new year. We'll see you guys next year. And <laughs> I threw darts at the dartboard this time. I'm at home at that this time. And two darts went on the same target, and you guys are going to love this. Arnold Schwarzenegger films. Yeah. Oh, oh my god. You're gonna start the new year with Arnold Schwarzenegger. Quick, let's get Put that cookie down. Arnold. I'm so there for that one. It is not a it is not a doom. I'm so there for that one. Uh. <laughs> oh my god. We do the whole episode like fake German accents. <laughs> Yes, Austrian. <laughs> Austrian. <laughs> just like over exaggerated. I'm going to enjoy the movie. <laughs> oh, I this is going to be so much fun. Need not to read. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! No. Oh, that might actually make a good April Fool's video. There's an entire <laughs> review, like just doing an art all place. Sorry. Oh, <laughs> Overall, this film is actually really good. The animation is great, and the story is actually top notch. I actually recommend it to anyone who likes soon, who likes this kind of film, who likes comedies and all that stuff. I give it a stop. The Arnold, Arnold, Arnold seal of approval. <laughs> if you haven't this seen, if you haven't seen Kindergarten Cop, go see it. It's a, it is like looking in the face of God and him saying back to you, you are my most wondrous creation. <laughs> it is my new God, the impersonation. By Jello pudding around eat you. <laughs> no, but Cosby, I do not want to eat your Jello pudding pops. <laughs> 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 I'm gonna love this next episode. Oh my yep, god! This is gonna be the, one of the best oh my episodes ever. Oh god! So, good night, everybody, and I hope you enjoyed this episode. Because you certainly will enjoy the next one. That's for sure. We'll be back. <laughs> Ciao for now. See you later, dudes. Nighty night. Bye.